The future's here. Welcome to episode three of the Warrior One podcast. I'm your host, Pashupa. And today we feature my interview with Reginald Hubbard, political activist and yogi. In the third and final episode of the Kumbhaka trilogy. If you haven't listened to the first two episodes yet, what are you waiting for? It's okay to go out of order. I'll give you the lowdown in each one, and you can choose how to go through time with it. The theme of episode one is the past, episode two is the present, and episode three is the the future. future. In every episode, we ask this question. How we best live this one brief magical life How? In this episode we're going to use our imagination and gaze into the future Woo! And bring the answer back Yeah The future is coming The future is here The future is all around us now Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. The warrior leaves the village. Where's she going now? To face the great unknown. What's so great about the unknown? Turns to us with, with all her gifts. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. The cosmos is around. Beneath our toes In yoga, kumbhaka is the retention of breath between the inhale and the exhale, or vice versa. The word kumbhaka is from the Sanskrit kumbha, which means pot, and they're comparing the torso to a vessel full of air. In the kumbhaka trilogy, I use this idea metaphorically to describe the pause that happens as the world shifts from pre-pandemic to the reality we exist in now. For me, that pause happened the weekend of March 14th, 2020. I was in a yoga training in Boulder, Colorado that was organized by American yoga innovator Amy Apolity, 
as part of her 90 Monkeys Yoga Education Program. It was co-taught by renowned yoga philosophy and Sanskrit teacher Manorma, and I had interviewed both of them for my yet-to-be-released podcast. And that was before I knew about the training, so I was really enjoying the synchronicity of having them together. I showed up to find out that Manorma had decided to stay in New York City because of the uncertainty surrounding the pandemic. Instead, we got her on Zoom projected on the large screen. Of course, I didn't realize then just how much live streaming would play a role in the future. I also didn't realize that this would be the last community gathering I would be part of for a while. It was the beginning of elbow bumps instead of hugs and handshakes, and it was before the masks and before we were hyper-aware of respiratory droplets, back when we were still practicing in a room together. But there were flights being canceled, and some of the students had left early to get home to their families. It was kind of interesting to see someone in class on Saturday and then on a Zoom call on Sunday from another state. Being in the training together, we had a beautiful sense of community. Many of us knew each other from previous 90 Monkey trainings, but there was also an uncertainty. There was a wave we knew was coming, but no one knew how big it was going to be, and no one knew how to prepare for it or how it would change us. In a sense, we were all holding our breath. I knew Reginald Hubbard from previous 90 Monkeys trainings, and he was easy to connect with. At this training, he seemed to sense the anxiety that was tugging at us all, and he helped us transform that nervous energy into laughter and gratitude whenever he spoke or interacted with us. I knew that he was a political activist with MoveOn.org, and I was intrigued to find out more about him, so I invited him to be a guest on this podcast. It might seem obvious now, but at the time I wasn't thinking about linking my three guests together on the podcast. I was going to do the same format as most podcasts out there these days, intelligent conversations with interesting people. The quarantine changed all that. I found myself writing more, singing more, playing more music, thinking deeper thoughts. I realized the podcast was a place where I could combine all of my creative pursuits and offer something really unique to the world. I also realized that the Kumbaka was a special time and would be a great way to tie the three interviews together. Since I had already begun recording the interviews before the concept was fully formed, the episodes in the trilogy also incorporate themes of time. Episode one is the past and features clips with my interview from Amy before the Kumbhaka. Episode 2, The Present, features clips from two interviews with Manorma, one before and one after the Kumbhaka. Episode 3, which you're listening to now, is The Future, and it features clips from two interviews with Reggie, both conducted after the Kumbhaka. If I had been able to foresee the future when I started, I might not have made things so complicated. It turns out that complexity takes time. The making of the trilogy has given me more clarity about how I want to produce episodes in the future, and so I'm grateful for the process. Okay, so now you're caught up. Let me finish introducing today's guest. Reginald Hubbard is a Congressional Affairs Liaison and Senior Political Strategist at MoveOn.org. Reggie is also a 500-hour certified yoga teacher, offering online classes through his Active Peace Yoga platform. In July 2020, Reggie launched a grassroots campaign along with David Lipsius, Amy Ippoliti, Jack Cornfield, and Tara Brock called Buddhists and Yogins United in an effort to inspire teachers and their respective communities to encourage active civic participation in politics and social activism. I named this podcast Warrior One because I believe that all of us have a warrior inside, the kind of warrior that can harness the power of love and use it to change the world in ways that benefit all beings. To me, Reggie is a living example of such a warrior. The primary scripture of Hinduism is the Bhagavad Gita, which is Sanskrit for the Song of God. It's a story that revolves around the dialogue of a warrior prince, Arjuna, and his charioteer, Krishna. 
It takes place on the eve of a battle in which Arjuna sees family and friends on both sides and experiences hopelessness and doubt. He seeks the counsel of Krishna, who reveals himself to be an avatar of the Godhead. Throughout their conversation, Krishna discusses three paths of yoga. The first, karma yoga, the path of action. The second, bhakti yoga, the path of devotion. And the third, jnana yoga, the path of knowledge. Underpinning each of these paths is the idea of dharma, which translates as duty or truth. How do we best live this one brief magical life? The Gita instructs us to see God in everyone, to be true to and engaged with our life's purpose, and not to be attached to personal outcomes. Reggie roots his political activism in the teachings of karma and bhakti yoga, action and devotion. We'll see how these philosophies influence his life and how they can benefit our own lives and the greater good of humanity as we journey through this podcast together. We'll start in Reggie's hometown of Severn, Maryland, 22 miles outside of Washington, D.C. When we were growing up, those are the biggest 22 miles in the world, right? Because we're just outside the Beltway. That in and of itself is its own uh, protection from Washington. So when you're in the Beltway, there's like a totally different feel of intensity So politics writ large didn't really have a lot to do with my life, aside from the fact that I ran for a class treasurer in the sixth grade, right? Like, um, so it was class treasurer, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and ran for class vice president my freshman year of high school, lost. That was also one of the more embarrassing moments of my life because my voice cracked. So this voice that everyone compliments was born of tremendous adversity. Uh, In my vice presidential speech, my voice cracked seven times. Yes, I remember from the top. I was like, good morning. I was like, oh, no. It's high school. Everyone's laughing. So I lose by like 99 votes um, and was class, I think, secretary. Yeah, I was class secretary in ninth grade, only to come back, run for class president in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade and win. So I swept for high school. So I was like high school class president. Uh, so that's what I was in. And I was also very involved in my church. So I think now in talking to you and reflecting on it, I think that is the beginning of this mixture, right? So I was very active in my church. So I had like a faith background and very active in trying to make change, even from an early age. And so as I've gotten older, especially in the past five years or so, it's been an increasing merger of those two. The seeds of Reggie's future were planted in his childhood. He encountered the path of politics and karma yoga in school and bhakti and devotion through his church. In the Bhagavad Gita's 18th chapter, Krishna says to the warrior Arjuna, It is better to strive in one's own dharma than to succeed in the dharma of another. Nothing is ever lost in following one's own dharma, but competition in another's dharma brings fear and insecurity. As an adult, Reggie found financial success working for corporate America as a product manager for a software company. But it wasn't his dharma. Living close to the Pentagon, he was deeply affected by the terrorist attacks of 9-11. The event awakened dormant seeds of karma and bhakti from Reggie's childhood, which began to root down and sprout up Their Their nascent nascent leaves leaves drawn drawn towards towards the light from from his future. Long, long, long story short, um, that set off a chain of events where I became increasingly disenchanted with my corporate lifestyle. And so, like, I was like, you know, y'all are crazy, but I don't know what to do about it. Um, They, in October of 2001, they were like, Reggie, you speak Spanish, right? I'm like, "Uh, yeah, I do. And they were like, we want you to go to Brazil to market your products because you speak Spanish. I was like, okay, you want me to go to Brazil because I speak Spanish. They're like, yeah, so just expedite your passport, get the visa, we'll pay for it, blah, blah, blah. And then Pashupa, uh, six days later, I'm in Sao Paulo. So I'm in Sao Paulo, speak no Portuguese, but I'm like, whatever. Like, y'all <laughs> want to send me here because I speak Spanish? I'm taking the trip, like, whatever. And that trip was supposed to be three days, ended up being three weeks. And so we went to like four or five places. And that was the first place I'd been to that was majority minority. 
that had had so much poverty, but people were still happy. And that just got to me, right? So as I became increasingly disenchanted, because I think I mentioned this, I majored in an existential philosophy in college. So like, I'm pretty acquainted with the dark night of the soul. So as I became increasingly disenchanted with my uh, job, Brazil just was in my mind, right? Because it was also the first trip I had taken since 9-11. So like, I'm in a new place on a plane for the first time. So it was pretty transformative and a pretty seminal moment. And my company just got increasingly worse and worse and worse. So much so that by 2003, I quit and moved to Rio de Janeiro. The Iraq war started when I was there. And all my Brazilian friends were like, why, like, what's up with your country? I'm like, y'all see that I left, right? Like, I'm in Brazil with you. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't really care. So I tried, as anyone in their late 20s would do, um, I tried to party away my conscience. So it was carnival, so I partied hard. That was the hardest I've ever partied. And I'm a former roadie, so like I've had a lot of fun. But um, <laughs> I drank for about 90 days straight. And um, at the end of that 90 days, I was just like, I need to rest my liver. And... <laughs> the feeling that I was trying to suppress was like the sense of obligation to go home. Right. And so at the end of 90 days, I was like, you know, I still got this feeling. So I'm going to go home and try and make a difference. So be careful what you wish for because the fates listen. Um, Nine months after essentially saying that I was working for John Kerry and John Edwards um, in that presidential bid. And I went from volunteer in the mailroom to traveling staff in like 60 days. Totally wow. meteoric ascension, totally, which is meteoric for anyone, especially like as someone who's black, right? So like it was just a total, total... Reggie totally didn't finish that sentence. He went on to another story, but you can add your own ending. Next up, Reggie's going to tell us a tale of tenacity from his brief time in the mailroom for the Kerry Edwards campaign. Pashuba, they had me in the mailroom, dog, the mailroom. I'm catching paper cuts <laughs> in the mailroom. And I couldn't get anyone to listen to me in John Kerry world, right? And so they were like, um, we'll get back to you, we'll get back to you. And I went to this one person who took a liking to me. I was just like, look, so... I feel like I can be honest with you. I'm just be straight up. I did not leave my sabbatical in Rio de Janeiro to catch my paper cuts in the mailroom. I was like, this is crazy. And she said, well, give it some time. I was like, I've given it two weeks. I'm tired of waiting. I was so bold one day. This is actually pretty stupid in retrospect, but I was, I was 29, so whatever. Um, she kept ducking me. And so I got there super early, went into her office, sat in the chair. And when she walked in, I'm like, hi, you've been avoiding me for a week. So can we talk now? I was like, because this is getting old, you know what I mean? So, like, can we talk about how I can help you with your internet fundraising, considering that I was a product manager for a startup software company and made a ton of money? Like, can we talk about that? Oh, sure, sure, sure. So she blows me off again. I'm in the mail room. I walk out, and the reason that she blew me off is to talk to her office mates about her new apartment. And her new apartment, she's like, I don't know if I like the neighborhood because it may be too ghetto for me. So white girl... White oh, girl shit. talking about it may be too ghetto for me if I shoot, I was not having it. I stormed out <laughs> of the mail room and I bump into the woman. Her name is Aquanetta. So Aquanetta's like, Reggie, how are things? I was like, I don't know. Ask your friend who doesn't want to live in the neighborhood that's too ghetto. I was like, I've had it. I'm sick of y'all. This sucks. I got to not leave Brazil for this. I'm done. And she's like, I think you'd be good at advance, which is the stuff I ended up doing. I was like, what is advance? And she's like, well, I'll, I'll introduce you to the director. And I was like, okay. So she introduces me to the director, and this is to the point that we're talking about. She's he's like, hey, I hear that you may be interested in advance. And I'm like, look here, ma'am. I don't know who you are. You don't know who I am. But here's what I'm going to tell you. It's Wednesday. I've been in the mailroom for two weeks catching paper cuts. John Kerry went to Yale, so did I. I speak three languages. How many do you speak? Okay, I, I figured that one. Barely got it. And I was like, so look, it's Wednesday. If you don't come up with something for me to do by Friday, just take my number out your phone. I'm sick of this stuff. I'm done. Like, whatever. So I walk out. <laughs> and they, call, <laughs> they called me back, man, you know. 
After the Kerry Edwards campaign ended, Reggie transitioned to working on Florida's 2006 gubernatorial campaign, supporting the Democratic candidate Jim Davis, a congressman from Florida's 11th Congressional District and his bid against Republican Charlie Christ, the state's attorney general. But while Reggie was making a difference in the political realm, he was neglecting his own health and well-being. Florida is one of the most tricky electoral challenges that we have. So <laughs> went to Florida, and that's where the lifestyle really got to me, right? So go from a presidential campaign, which is grueling on a good day. Um, I'm in charge of a 747. So I work with Secret Service to make sure that everything gets off and on and off the plane. I'm sleeping like three hours a night and I have to be perfect because any mistake I make ends up in the New York Times or causes to mess up the schedule or all these other things. Move to Florida where I had internalized that pressure, right? So we lost in 2004. We've got to do this in 2006. So I was the traveling uh, chief of staff and traveling advisor to this guy who was running for governor for 18 months. So I was on the road for 18 months, man, like 60,000 miles driven. I don't even know how many thousand miles on a plane, 18 hour days. That lifestyle just got worse and worse and worse and worse. I gained about probably 80 pounds from when I left Rio in 2003 to the end of the campaign in 2006. You gain five pounds a month, you know, over a year. That's how, that's how you get to 60. That is how I got pretty much hit rock bottom. You become so addicted to wanting to make a difference that you don't know that you're killing yourself. In spite of sacrificing his health, the 2006 Jim Davis Florida gubernatorial campaign ended in defeat, and Reggie transitioned to producing political events for Joe Biden and Michelle Obama, but found himself completely burned out by the work. It was at this low point that yoga came into his life. November 2014, at 40 years old, took my first class at the uh, invitation of my dear friend Tracy. When the election ended, I made a promise to myself. I was like, okay, I'm only going to do things that make me smile, lower my blood pressure, and appeal to my creative sensibility. That's it. I'm not doing anything else. Like, I don't trust politics. I got to get out of here. And as a creative soul, I was like, I'm dead on the inside. Like, I've got to bring this back to life. My friend Tracy yeah. was like, Reggie, you should come to yoga with me. I'm like, okay. Lower blood pressure, make me smile, <laughs> creative. Okay, I'll give it a shot. Went to one class, and I was in a creative spot, right? And you know how most studios are, right? So they're like 30 for 30. So I tried all this different stuff, and it was cool, and it was feeding my spirit and, you know, helping me reanimate. In January 2015, I moved to Denver because I thought that I was moving there for the job of my dreams. <laughs> Day six, it became a nightmare. And I said this in the Dharma I talked this past weekend. I was like, I started my intentional yoga practice to not curse out my boss. Like, <laughs> I was this close every day. There was this woman who ran this nonprofit in Denver that I moved out to help. And she just treated me poorly. And I'm in psychological abuse uh, and I was like I really am this close but I a I can't be angry black male I'm 62 like I can't do that and secondly I moved out here and I'm $3000 in the hole like I got to stay to try and get this money back right so I went to sunrise and sunset yoga asana every day to keep from losing my temper and what I didn't know, and now I know now, is that you're just building your reserves, right? You're building compassion. You're building perspective. You're building patience. And so 10 months later, when they fired me via text message, I was <laughs> able to look them in the face because they were like, you know, we should do an um, exit interview. And I'm like, y'all know that's not a good use of all of our time. Y'all know that's not cool. I was like, but I do want to thank you for something. And they're like, what's that? I was like, I want to thank you for how poorly you treated me because you taught me how to deal with adversity with grace. By 2018, Reggie was back in D.C. 
and enrolled in a 200-hour yoga teacher training program with Faith Hunter. Reggie negotiated with Faith to swap a segment of his local training for classes at the Yoga Journal Conference in New York City. He wanted to study with some of the modern masters, and it was there that he met Amy Apoliti. I'm going to go to this Yoga Journal thing in New York. All these cool teachers are going to be there, so... Alan Finger and Rodney Yee and Sean Korn. And I didn't know Amy at that time, but I was like, and this other woman who looks pretty cool, I want to take her class on the SOAS. The SOAS. Now, let me tell you all a story about my brother. My so-as brother. In 2018, Reggie took the train to Midtown Manhattan to do that yoga journal thing. Uh, we're at the New York Hilton, uh, Midtown Manhattan. Big room. You know how Amy's, Amy's classes get there. has got to be like 110 people in this room. Yeah. 110 people in the room. Reggie's in the room, doing the warm-up thing. Turning inward, feeling groovy. Get your groove on. Next thing you know, Amos says to the class. On an inhale, step the right foot forward and go on up into Virabhadrasana 2. Warrior 2. And I open up and this loud snap, the loudest I've ever snapped. Pop, and I'm in Vera 2. And she's like, did someone just snap their fingers? <laughs> I looked at her and I was like, yeah, so what? Yeah, so what? Like, yeah, so what? Yeah, so what? Like, yeah, so what? So, so what? What's up? What's so what? Up? Uh, what about the so as? It's all about the so as. So it was love at first snap. Love at first snap with the so as in your lap. Searching for a treasure on an anatomy map. Searching for the so Let him free, dude. Let him free. Dude. Let him free. We all want to be free. If you don't know what we're talking about, yo, it's a muscle connects your high to your low. It's a so deepest part it connects to your lumbar spine goes over your pelvis cross an iliopubic eminence line to the lesser trochanter of your femur bone your femur bone. Femur bone. that's a big one in your thigh in case you don't know now you know it's the so as motherfucking so as So as I was saying, so as the story goes, the very next year I was searching for my soul. I wanted to create a freaky podcast. I was in Boulder, Colorado and all around I asked, who's a yoga teacher who's up for the test? They said, Amy Ippolity. You know she's got your back at the Breckenridge Yoga Fest. I got myself a day pass. Amy said, come and meet me at my workshop. On the so as, so as you know. A few months later, I met Reggie at the training. We compared notes about how we found Amy. It all comes back to the workshop on the so as. So as you know, he's my so as brother. Yeah, we're all so as warriors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the rest is history. We'll live happily ever after with a little bit of laughter. Yes, so what? Yeah, so what? If we take care of of our so as. Honest connection with the snap, and then just like having like the shared interest of like how do we as people of the yogic tradition alleviate suffering in the world? Because that's the point, man. Like it's not about like oh my goodness, doesn't my split look awesome on Instagram? That's not the practice. 
practice is peace. The practice is like standing. And I, and I taught when I taught this week, and that's what I said. We held goddess pose for I don't know how long. And I was like, ladies and gentlemen, this is yoga. Like, can you stand in an uncomfortable position for an indeterminate amount of time and keep your peace? Keep your peace. Keep your peace. Keep your peace. Reggie began to bring the lessons of yoga into his work in politics. And this path led him to produce events for Bernie Sanders, which then brought him into contact with Move On. Move On is an organization that began with a petition during the Clinton impeachment debate of 1998. The idea was to censor President Clinton and move on. After all, it was a blowjob, not an insurrection. The good old days of bad presidents. The Move On petition was the first major digital intervention in American politics, And since then, Move On has grown into a political force. This is the story of how Reggie came to work for them. So after I got fired via text message in 2016, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, and that's important because um, that's how I can tie into the spiritual aspect of yoga because I've already got a faith base, right? So um, I'm nowhere near as dogmatic as I used to be, but I do have comfortability and familiarity with, with, with spiritual practice. and so. When I got fired via text message, I went old school Baptist and was just like, I clearly need to get this situation out of my system. So I took a full fast. Like I didn't eat anything for five days. I drank water, did asana three times a day, prayed and meditated because I was like, that entire experience has got to get out of this body. Didn't want to be here in the first place. You treated me like shit for 10 months and you fired me via text message be gone. So when I break this fast, I trust that whatever I'm meant to do will happen. I broke the fast on my birthday, September 30th through October 5th. I took a full fast. And when I broke the fast that night, I get a phone call from a friend of mine that says, Hey, I am, we're in Denver and you know, we're with the Bernie Sanders campaign. And we want to know if you can help us out. And I'm like, sure, you know, what do you want? You want me to call some folks or, you know, um, because there's an unwritten rule in the world of politics is that, like, you never know who's going to be your boss next. So be nice to everybody. And so um, always answer the phone, you know, is pretty much the unwritten rule. And they're like, no, um, we have a rally in Boulder, Colorado. There's Boulder again. And um, we're expecting 10,000 people and 70 press, I was like, oh, you want me to produce it? I was like, lucky for you and for me, I got fired last week. (laughs) So (laughs) so that's this weekend, I can come help you. So produce that rally, produced a couple more, and end up being like one of the top producers, eventually becoming the executive producer for the Bernie Sanders experience. Produced Bernie's concession in 2016 at the DNC one of the most challenging moments that I've had in my political career, because it's essentially like looking at a tempest. You're in like a raft. There's a tempest. You're going directly into it. You're like, oh my God, I hope I make it out of here. (laughs) So in 2017, Bernie was one of the few people that was doing anything. And I still had a good relationship. And I still do have a good relationship with them, but I had a good relationship with them. And I produced, I was their in-town guy. So every time they did stuff in Washington, D.C., I produced for them and, then we did, when he did stuff for the DNC, um, talking about unity, I produced a lot of those shows. And it got to the point where, because I did the concession and because like, I'm also really, really good under pressure, Move On and Bernie Sanders folks became a team and they produced healthcare rallies. So when the Trump folks and the Republicans were trying to take out the ACA in 17, Bernie Sanders agreed to do four events. They gave me the first one in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with about 30 hours notice. And so I'm like, okay, I'll do it. And I was like, so just rent me a car, I'll drive to Pittsburgh, and we'll figure it out. Go to Pittsburgh, basically catch lightning in a bottle again. Um, Move on, folks, is actually, this is the hilarious part of the story. So, 7 o'clock show, uh, 2,000 people show up, in like two days notice, right? So like we have like our structure, we have the messaging, we have all, well, all the branding, lights, whole whole stage setup and everything. This woman rolls up literally in her wheelchair and is like, hey, I'm part of the program. 
And so this is where I'm lucky. I'm from the South. So I feign stupidity. I said, ma'am, which program are you talking about? <laughs> and, and she's like, the speaking program. I'm like, okay, ma'am, hold on. I'll get right back to you because she didn't know that I was the, the producer. So I take my guy who was the site person. I tap him on the shoulder. I'm like, come follow me. We get backstage and I look at him. I'm like, why is this the first time? The show's in 45 minutes. Why is this the first time I'm finding out this woman can't walk? This is crazy. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I had to break character because this is crazy. I was just like, this is a healthcare rally and she is one of the people, she is a local activist and she has no way on the stage because no one told me she can't walk. Like who had that information that didn't share it? This is crazy. So because I believe in God and always treat people nice, I called this woman, her name is Michelle. I was like, Michelle, she was the um, purveyor. She's the person who we signed the contract with. I was like, so you told me to call you if I need anything, right? And she's like, yeah. I was like, so it's 620, show starts at seven. You wouldn't happen to have a pneumatic lift anywhere near here, do you? And she's like, actually, <laughs> in a room adjacent to the stage, there's a lift. And so Pashupa, there was she, there was the lift. The way we had built the stage, there was a perfect cubby hole for the lift to fit in. There was a auxiliary wow. power source that was near the place where we set the stage. And at 6.55, that woman was on the stage. <laughs> Dude. Hallelujah. I went, to, I went to my team and I was like, so what you just saw here? is why I wear these beads. Like, this is why I pray. This is it. This is God's work. <laughs> like, like, I'm just a recipient <laughs> of this awesomeness. Holy shit. Like, this... Whew. And then I go backstage, and this is where the move-on piece comes in. I meet these guys. and like, hey, how are you? And I look at them, and I was like, you don't know me much. I don't know you much, but let me tell you something. When someone can't walk, that is an important piece of information. And as a producer, I need to know everything. So I don't know who you think you are, but next time we work together, don't give me some half-assed shit. <laughs> and the guy's like, Haha. I was like, I'm very serious. I was like, you're very lucky that I'm good at what I do. I was like, because otherwise, everything that you're hoping would have happened would have been failed rally because disabled activists can't speak that guy ended up being my partner so i went to them i saw about a month later they had a job opening and at that point i was tired of being in the gig economy i was tired of being on the road i'd been on the road for about three years at that time um and to your point about being out of balance like i was super I had totally become like ingrained in my practice. So I was like, I can't be on the road. Like I've got to ground. I need to sit still. This job opening comes across my email inbox. And so I emailed them. I was like, hi, I'm Reggie. I'm the guy that cursed you out a couple of weeks ago. So sorry about that. So you have this opening for a Washington DC coordinator. The job is a small job, but I actually don't want to do a lot of stuff. Let me run the office and manage the relationships. I don't want to be on the road anymore. And I was like, I venture to say that Washington DC is far more important than you anticipated it being. I know everyone on Capitol Hill. I was in Bernie Sanders world as one of his top lieutenants and I don't want to travel. So let me come to DC and I'll make all the logistics work for you. And I don't really need any of the credit. And they were like, really? I'm like, look, just don't make me a stupid offer. You know, pay me more than what the what is listed, and I'm good. So that's how I got started. Now that you have a pretty good idea of who Reggie is, I want to take you on a journey. In October of 2019, I moved to Colorado, and five months later, I was taking a yoga workshop with Amy Manorama and Reggie, which inspired the Kumbhaka trilogy. The pandemic experience that began for me on that weekend, March 14th, 2020 was a womb that I went into and then emerged from with this podcast. I went in thinking that I was an interviewer, and I came out knowing I'm also a songwriter, storyteller, and source of cosmic laughter. Colorado was a wonderful place to live like a monk while the pandemic raged, but the winds of change have been blowing through my life again, and it's time to ramble on. As I record this, I am moving back east to western Massachusetts, where I spent the first decade of the millennium. 
Heading east is a metaphor for going back in time, and going back to live in a place I left behind feels that way a bit. I also feel the archetype of the hero's journey, leaving a place and then returning with wisdom. Returning to learn new skills, to be with people I love, to build a future, to keep evolving. The one year anniversary of the Kumbaka weekend is ahead, and I am visualizing myself moving towards it in space and time. For me, it is the finish line, it's the deadline, it's the line in the sand. I want to close the trilogy by then because humans love anniversaries and I have new ideas I want to work on. So here's how the rest of this episode works I'm recording segments as I drive across the country. From Boulder, Colorado to Northampton, Mass. Each night I will stay in a different town, adding narrative to the clips I have already recorded. Tonight, I'm in a dive hotel in Grain City, Missouri, recording the audio that you're listening to. Earlier this morning, I recorded my voice on the shore of Wilson Lake, Kansas, after leaving the tiny home that I stayed at in Lucas, Kansas. So let's start with that. Thursday, March 4th, 2021, Lucas, Kansas. Yesterday, I traveled from Luna to Lucas. After moving out of my Boulder apartment, I needed some time to decompress and reorganize before getting on the road. My friend Luna kindly offered me a space. With time and space, anything is possible. Luna is an Argentinian artist who you will probably meet someday on this podcast. But for the purpose of this story, just know that she is a woman of vision. And her home is filled with colorful objects, lights, drawings, paintings, tarot cards, and other reminders of the unknown. I added my own guitars and ukuleles and coolers of fermenting kombuchas to the mix. And we sat on a padded carpet and pillows, making art and music, laughing and sharing stories and ideas. Now, naughty psychonauts often turn their thoughty thoughts to space and time and the exponential potentialities of infinity and eternity. Given enough space and time, some fractal fraction of infiniternity, surely an intelligence would arise wise enough to create new life. And if the technology could procreate, soon the multiverse would be filled with simulations inside of simulations. And these conversations with Luna inspired a song, and in the end, she sings along. So now I present to you the Simulation Song. I'm gonna revel in my unraveling Because I don't know where I'm traveling I share my love where I can find it But if I can't, then I don't mind it Because there's a monk inside of me Right next to my Dionysus And the patterns and prisms of reality They disguise what is the real me But I think I'm alive Yeah, you know I'm alive Although it could be a simulation In some adolescent alien's basement Most likely I'm alive You're probably alive Well, the best is yet to come It's right there on the tip of your tongue Just take your time to taste it For if too soon you will surely waste it So just sing into the void And the dolphins will be overjoyed As they dance around the cosmic octopus Alive in the void of poipus Yeah, they're probably alive Most likely alive Although I could be an avatar Who plays a psychedelic ukulele You go, boy 
mi musa musical most likely alive am I alive are you alive estoy viva yeah yeah well 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 now I've heard that there's a possibility Every time that we make a decision Our souls undergo a division And with no limit to infinity We're all the fractals of divinity Potential Exponential who think they're alive Although we could be a simulation Inside another simulation Inside When's our code gonna be updated? Simulaciones dentro de Simulaciones dentro de Simulaciones There's turtles all the way down there's definitely turtles all the way down Yeah, there's turtles all the way down Most likely alive Estás volviendo loca <laughs> March 8th, 2021 Louisville, Kentucky Jefferson Square Park Louisville, where my father grew up, the city where I visited my grandparents as a child. I am here just ahead of the one-year anniversary of the killing of Breonna Taylor by Louisville police. I am in the park where vigils and protests were held in her name. Today, there is a demonstration against war crimes committed in the Tigray region of Ethiopia by armed forces from the neighboring country, Eritrea. There are about 40 women with beautiful dark skin standing on the steps of the Capitol building, dressed in black and holding Ethiopian flags. They chant and speak out against rape, against genocide, against the conditions for mass starvation that are being created. They chant and speak out for an 18-year-old woman named Mona Lisa, who lost her hands and legs resisting rape. They hope someone will listen, that the U.S. will intervene. Brianna's murder occurred on March 13th, the Friday that began the Kumbaka weekend. Most of us would not hear about her death until the murder of George Floyd two months later. I don't know what it is like to be black, to live in fear that someone will kill me in the night, to live in fear of rape or genocide. I came to the park to feel a connection to the sorrow, to try some more to wrap my head around the insanity of human behavior. I've been pondering the relationship of order to chaos. Those who cling too tightly to order often end up committing atrocities. They want to impose their will on the world. On the other hand, too much chaos and there is no ground to stand on, no place to feel safe. Humans do best when we can balance order and chaos. The murder of George Floyd caused me to look more deeply at the racism that is baked into Western culture, to our societies and our psyches. I learned about the racist roots of American policing, from their beginnings as slave patrols to becoming enforcers of Jim Crow laws with ties to the Klan, and to lynchings. I learned how we built our highways to segregate people, the ways we have kept people of color from healthy food and quality education, how each and every long-standing American institution has inequality at its core. In my mind, I see the chasm that has been created. For so long, white people have been stealing breath from people of color. Most of us are ashamed and appalled, but also scared to release our hold. What chaos will be unleashed if we apologize, or offer reparations, 
or tear down the systems of oppression we have built. The liberal is more comfortable with chaos, the conservative more prone to clinging to what they know. But we need each other to move forward. The politicization of COVID has eclipsed its greatest teaching, that we are all connected. I can't breathe is the mantra of a broken society. We should be sharing our breath, not stealing the air from one another. That bell marks the beginning of the next segment, which will last for 8 minutes and 46 seconds, and end with the same bell. On May 25, 2020, George Floyd, a 46-year-old black man, was killed in Minneapolis, Minnesota, while being arrested for allegedly using a counterfeit bill. During his arrest, Derek Chauvin, a white police officer with the Minneapolis Police Department, knelt on Floyd's neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. Here is Reggie from November 2020 sharing his thoughts on George Floyd. It's hard to think that that was only five months ago, six months ago. Yeah. It seems as though eons have transpired in the past six months, right? So it goes back to when we, when we had the lineup or when we had the, the class in March about quadratic time and future past present at the same time. So like, it's as if the recent past is the distant past, but it gave birth to a new future kind of thing. And I've shared this with you as friends, but the lived experience of African-American men and police are, you know, we expect them to do bad things to us, right? You know, we expect to be harassed. We expect that. And, you know, to some extent we expect to get shot, honestly. And, you know, so many brothers have been shot that America had become desensitized to that. But to witness a murder through strangulation of eight minutes and 46 seconds, my teaching practice was just getting going at that point. And I think that's what kind of catalyzed me as a teacher to some extent, because I was just very raw about that experience and and, and about how it had impacted me, not only from a personal perspective, but from a spiritual perspective, because I had people meditate um, for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And I was like, you see how long that was? That means that Mr. Um, Chauvin meant to kill Brother Floyd. Like, to do anything for nine minutes is intentional, right? You know, nine minutes is not an insignificant amount of time, especially with respect to strangulation. I asked Reggie what he was involved in politically at the time and how the news affected his activism. Um, I was home. Uh, We were just beginning uh, COVID relief stuff, so we... Uh, from an activist perspective, we're lobbying the House and lobbying the Senate with respect to the, the second round of COVID stimulus. And then and that was just a powder keg that just r- exposed something that we all needed to see. The protests over the murder of George Floyd swept across the U.S. and around the world, sparking a defund the police campaign and galvanizing the Black Lives Matter movement. Growth and progress often come from loss and tragedy. I asked Reggie how the murder of George Floyd has changed things in his life and in the world around him. Yeah, the best part of the best part of that tragedy is I'll speak micro, personal and then macro. All of the practices that I've done thus far prepared me to endure that awful experience with equanimity. And from that experience of equanimity, I've been able to teach and share, and to, you know, to some extent, like a Pied Piper of sorts, be like, okay, dear America, dear white friends, dear white people, now that you're awake, don't go back to sleep. It's up to you to change this, right? Like Black people caring about cops killing us, that ain't going to change nothing. We've hated this since they chased us as slaves. Now it's up to you and y'all to do something about this, because what if this was your child? 
I need you to personalize this experience and not view it in the abstract. And so the beauty, if it can be said this way, of the pandemic is that people couldn't go and just, oh, whatever, you know, Minnesota, blah, blah, blah. Like we were all stuck and we had to deal with that. There are many people, I'll say I'm pleasantly surprised at how many people, thousands of people actually still want to have racial discussions. Like, um, And I would say that it was the George Floyd experience specifically created such seismic shifts that allowed my teaching to explode, not just from an activist perspective, but in the yoga world, because people looked around and were like, oh my God, <laughs> there are no real black teachers. Yeah, because... Uh, Hey, white supremacy. Right. So because, <laughs> because of the training and the pedigree that I have. Right. So Faith Hunter, Amy Apolity, Rod Stryker and Dharma Mitra are like my teachers. Unfortunately, it's also white supremacists in that I needed all these amazing teachers to be heard to some extent. But it's a blessing that I had them and had done all this training. So when the moment was there, I could just step in. And not just be like, oh, you know, you know, so I could come in with all the credentials that I have, not only in the political space, but in the yoga world and just be able to serve, but also serve with truth and power. In July of 2014, a black man named Eric Garner was put in a chokehold by white New York City police officer Daniel Pantaleo. He pleaded, I can't breathe 11 times before losing consciousness and dying. In 2018, Christopher Lowe died while handcuffed to the back of a police cruiser in Fort Worth, Texas, after telling them he couldn't breathe. In March 2019, Javier Ambler II died while being arrested in Austin, Texas. His final words, I can't breathe. In May 2019, Derek Scott died in Oklahoma City after being restrained by officers for about 13 minutes. When Scott told the police multiple times that he couldn't breathe, one said, I don't care, and another said, you can breathe just fine. John Elliott Neville died in Winston-Salem, North Carolina in 2019 after being restrained in the Forsyth County Jail. He said, I can't breathe at least 28 times, as well as help me and mama. Manuel Ellis died on March 3rd, 2020, during an arrest by police officers in Tacoma, Washington. Ellis pleaded, I can't breathe, with officers before dying in the minutes after his arrest. Video showed police punching Ellis repeatedly during his arrest. George Floyd pleaded, I can't breathe, many times before losing consciousness. Derek Chauvin continued the restraint for two minutes and 53 seconds after Floyd became unresponsive, while three other officers watched. Who can watch this and not say, fuck the police? Man, I can't breathe my face. Just get up. What do you want? I can't breathe. Please don't need my dick. I can't breathe shit. Uh Bro, get up, get in the car, man. I will. Get up, get in the car. I can't move. I've been waiting the whole time. Ah. Man. Get up, get in the car. Mama. Get up and get Mama. in the car right. He was a blessed child. Okay, he was blessed. He was good. And did not deserve to be murdered at the hands of the police. Eight minutes and 46 seconds. Do you remember when it started? It's enough time for Reggie to tell his story, for me to mention seven black men strangled by police, to hear George Floyd beg for his life, call out for his mother, and to hear the howling sorrow in Manuel Ellis' mother's voice. The anger I feel towards the police and the system that supports them it's harder to feel towards a COVID virus. There's no perceived malevolence with the virus. It's just part of nature doing what it does. There are hundreds and thousands of people around the world connected to ventilators, chanting that same I can't breathe mantra in their heads, with fear in their bodies and death ahead of them. But somehow that that feels different to witness. 
I wonder if there is a benefit of detaching our outrage from the problem of racism and viewing it as a disease. It seems to be passed down through generations, along with guilt and fear and ignorance. Is there some way we can psychologically vaccinate our children and prevent racism from spreading into the future? If so, how do we convince the anti-vaxxers? Part of the path of yoga is a practice of breath work, of expanding and controlling breath. While the philosophies of yoga contain wisdoms that can be of service in defunding racism in the long term, the practice of breath work can help see us through our day to day struggles. When the human being is under stress, what's the first thing they do? Shorten their breath. I found this from my lived experiences that not only as I've taught more, but as I've expanded my own personal breath work practice, that the prana which lives on the breath just is magic, right? So like when, when you expand your breath, it expands your consciousness. It, it, it cuts attachment and, and tethering to the past. It makes you radically present. And in that radical presence, you can serve more mightily. When you're radically present as opposed to like, uh, like looking down or pretending like something isn't going on, like that's where the transformation takes place. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe. The Fox News decision desk can now project that former Vice President Joe Biden will win Pennsylvania and Nevada, putting him over the 270 electoral votes he needs to become the 46th president of the United States. So there will be, and I think, I think we've experienced it to, to some extent already, like there has been an energetic lightening, not lightning, but lightening, um, since two weeks ago, two Saturdays ago, when Pennsylvania was called, right? So there's already yeah. been like a collective global, <sighs> right? Yeah. So that becomes a bit more profound when uh, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris assume office, right? So the governing energy of the apparatus shifts totally at that moment. That is powerful. And the symbolism of Black, Brown, woman, Vice President, that begins to germinate, right? So like that historical first cements and now with that projection news that the president is continuing to fight saying he will not concede and will fight this legal battle in courtrooms across the country hopefully he will have found some level of valor and dignity and 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 conceded but if not we are committed to an orderly transition uh, into a safe inauguration and the american people deserve nothing less I woke up on a Sunday with the insurrection blues. I saw what my fellow countrymen could do. I don't let it get to me. No way. I'm above the fray. I try. People are all fucking crazy. And what else can you say? We're all looking for a leader to get us out of this mess. Instead of looking in our own hearts for the source of happiness, we've only got one planet and we've only got one life. We got to fathom our divinity and hold each other tight. Yeah, hold me tight now.
Friday, March 12th, Syracuse, New York. The city where I grew up. It's a conservative place, partly left behind after the corporations of the so-called greatest generation moved out. I had black friends in my childhood and don't remember feeling any differently about them. By high school, I began noticing that some people in my mostly white peer group would say negative things about black people. I did not understand it or feel it, but I did not stand against it either. I was desperately trying to fit in and using drugs and alcohol to smooth over the edges where I didn't. It wasn't until I left Syracuse to go to college that I realized the water I had been swimming in. Before then, I rebelled against the institutions of school, church, and other authority figures without a conscious objective. I had an unconscious sense of their inauthenticity, but no critical understanding of why. Once I started meeting people from outside of the Syracuse bubble, I began to see the world more clearly. I made friends with different pigmentations and sexual orientations, for sure. But I also began to find out about the systems of oppression and exploitation that affect us all. It was the exploitation of animals that really got me. One look behind the curtain and seen into the horrors of factory farming, and my whole world unraveled. The horrors of slavery and rape and torture and brutal dominion are all there. Because we classify some sentient beings as animals and others as humans, excuses none of it. It has no more inherent meaning than black or white, gay or straight. The morality of eating animals can be debated, but there is no argument for factory farming that does not deprive us of our own humanity. And there's no way to sustain animal agriculture at its current levels that does not deprive future generations of an inhabitable planet. In the same way that racism hurts everyone on all sides, meat-centered diets are killing us all. And that, in a nutshell, is karma. The more we selfishly take for ourselves, the worse everyone's situation becomes. The more we live to serve others, the better our own lives become. Despite its overall conservatism, It was in moving back to Syracuse after college that I met some radical vegans who were also deeply compassionate towards humans, and they inspired me to become vegan. My diet and lifestyle inevitably caused some old relationships to fall away. I'm sure I was too outspoken in the early days of it, and people didn't want to hear it. But once we begin to see behind the curtain of capitalism and bigotry, it's hard to remain silent. Decades after letting go of my relationships with people who were caught in racism and bigoted worldviews, I find myself wondering how to connect with those same kinds of people. It benefits people in positions of power to keep us all separated and living in our own realities. But the survival of the human race and most other forms of life on the planet require us to work together. Hatred and anger is not benefiting anyone. Partisan bickering means nothing to me, brother. We have huge humanitarian problems that if I look at you and be like, well, you're not progressive enough or you're not Democrat or you're not Republican. Guess what? Climate change will kill all of us. Right. Yeah. Racial problems will kill all of us. Right. Like either either society will implode in addition to like people who look like me getting killed or shot. Healthcare and the biggest one, coronavirus, is nonpartisan. I mean, there's a disproportionate effect on black and brown communities, but everybody's dying because of this. I'm more inclined to view things from a humanitarian perspective, like how can we help humanity? So specifically, now that the election has passed, me demonizing the Republican Party means nothing because there's 73 million people that voted for Donald Trump. And, and, and those people, in my mind, are sick. Like, not from a political circumstance, but you, what what are you not seeing? How can you not see 
that this gentleman doesn't care <laughs> about you, only cares about his self-aggrandizement, and that blindness is affecting all of us. So demonizing them because who they voted for is not in my interest as a healer. I just want to know, like, how can I shift your blindness or how can I like shine light onto what you're not seeing? Or how can I help you wake up to the fact that your ignorance is killing you and me? I mean, the solution (laughs) is in having tough conversations. We have to be able to hold space with someone and be like, where do we agree? Right. I I acutely know where we don't agree. That's completely understandable. Where do we agree? And how can we use that as a foundation to build a more common understanding? In the resistance, it was easy because we had to get Trump out. And, you know, we still have work to do on that front to some extent. But that was easy. Now it gets a little bit more intricate, right? So now what? Like he's out, now what? Like there's still, like I said, millions upon millions upon millions of people that think that his worldview is helpful when data suggests that it's not. It'll take people having the courage to step into situations that are not comfortable, right? Um, It'll take tough conversations. Um, You know, one of the things that I was instrumental in during impeachment was reaching out to the conservative forces and being like, look, we don't agree on much, but you want to save the Republic, right? Right. Like, you know, what this dude is doing is detrimental to the government, which you think we need less of, but you think we should have a functioning system, right? So using that as a basis of conversation allowed for a small relationship to form between the progressive left and the far right conservative group. And I'm hopeful that there are people who can remember that we worked together on impeachment. So now um, in whatever role I take on, I can call them and be like, hey, where else can we work together? Right. So we work together on this. Right? So it will take that level of, OK, I understand that we don't, quote unquote, agree on the minutia, but can we agree on the macro? And if we agree on the macro, then we can fi- that we can filter out the minutia. Honestly, we have far more in common. Look, no one wants to be sick, right? You know, no one. Ev- everyone wants to have like a, a comfortable life. Everyone wants to be healthy and be and safe and free. Everyone wants that, regardless of your political affiliation. You know, what what has happened, and we have allowed ourselves to be manipulated by people at the top who are exploiting our quote-unquote differences for their benefit. And so we have to upset the apple cart to some extent and just remind folks, be like, hey, we actually have a lot in common. It's them that aren't like us because they're seeking to exploit us. And that's hard. If the right message can be articulated being like, hey... You don't like being played, right? That makes you feel awful. Well, you're being played. So um, how can you rebel against that in a way that is good for all of us and not just in your self-interest? That, again, that's tough, but that, that's kind of what has to happen. Our humanity has more in common than our progressive desi- or our political designations, right? So if we begin to see things from the, from the standpoint of our common humanity, that is a basis from which you can build a broader coalition, then you're not progressive enough. That that doesn't mean anything anymore. Not to me. Yeah. In July of 2020, Reggie joined a coalition of 116 prominent yoga teachers and Buddhist leaders who wanted to encourage members of their communities to vote in the upcoming 2020 presidential election. Buddhist and Yogans United, that was our launch event in July. Um, We had been in discussion prior to, so Jack and Tara and David um, launched Buddhists um, United, and they reached out to Amy, who pulled me in. The wellness space used to be, and it still is to some extent, but we've done a really good job of like hammering away at people's ignorance, willful ignorance, I would say, is that the, I come to yoga to escape the world. I don't, I don't do yoga to get engaged. And I was like, then you're not practicing yoga. Like you're doing calisthenics 
and avoidance. Like the practice of yoga is to be, ra- especially from a tantric perspective, is to be radically present with what's going on. And from that radical presence, seek to alleviate suffering in the world and or do your part as um, as service to your dharma in the world. So the initiative basically created an environment where more people started talking about civic engagement. You know, we really didn't have much in terms of infrastructure, but we all had profiles and access to people to get a conversation going. So the, the, the campaign became more of an awareness raising um, and getting people to talk about it because no one was talking about this stuff before. There was still tremendous hesitancy. And Amy and I talked about it last week um, just because she and I, she and I became like soul brother and soul sister on, on this movement. <laughs> um, but um, we talked about how because we just were at it, we were like the voting yogis. We were like the people who were just like, and now what? And now what? Again and again and again, that it basically created an environment to normalize this conversation about civic engagement, as opposed to people being like, I'm just here to, you know, I mean, we've all been to yoga classes where people spit platitudes that have nothing to do with what's happening in the world. Like things are so tough right now. So just settle into, no, like, things are not tough right now. Like George Floyd got murdered. You know what I mean? So like that it's as if we brought more satya into the practice. We brought more truth because people were avoiding the harsh reality because they didn't want to quote unquote deal with it. Karma yoga is the yoga of action. Every action we take creates reactions and those ripple out into the universe. Because the universe is vast and complex, we cannot predict with much accuracy what the results from our actions will be. We can get on the midnight train to Georgia, but we might fall asleep and wake up in Florida instead. And there's always a possibility that chaos will intervene. The teachings of yoga and Buddhism revolve around the calming of the mind. In the West, we picture a monk going in a cave to meditate. But as Ram Dass said, if you really want to test your progress on the spiritual path, you should go visit your family on Thanksgiving. Bhakti yoga is the yoga of devotion, and its pitfall is that we can become too caught up in faith and connecting to some higher plane of existence and lose touch with the reality of the world we are in. If we see God as somewhere else and our surroundings as mundane, then we miss the point. Karma yoga is the yoga of effort and structure. The more we meditate and practice compassion, the more clearly we see the world around us. With that clarity, we make better judgments and our actions are more likely to bring about positive results. But there's no guarantee that they will. And so to achieve peace of mind, we must also be willing to let go of our attachment to the results of our actions. Bhakti is the yoga of letting go and trusting in the chaos. Whether we believe in a specific deity is less important than whether we believe in one another. The world around us is either completely created by chance laws of physics, or it has some deeper purpose and meaning. Either way, it is the world we are given. If we can connect to the beauty and harmony of it, it's easy to feel gratitude and love. But sometimes the circumstances of our lives make it hard to connect and hard to see the divine in one another. The practice is to keep on keeping on. Work to build the world we believe is possible and trust that there are forces beyond our control that are moving us in the right direction. Question everything, keep our minds open, and use compassion as a compass. I'm blessed in that. Like, I'm rooted in the stories of my ancestors. I know that my great-great-grandparents couldn't vote. So because they couldn't vote, that's why I'm an activist. Get to know who you are and where you came from, because in so doing, you'll realize how to make the most impact on your community. Without that grounding and rooting, there's no substantial progress in history repeats itself. if you know where you came from 
and offer your full self to whatever endeavor, whether it be taking care of homeless folks or like helping immigrant children who've been separated from their family. Like whatever you choose to do, if you do so with pure intention and know how to communicate that with others, that only can allow your activism to flourish. Bhakti gets us out, out of bed And karma gets us all the train The warrior must prepare the mind To withstand the sting of the arrow of time Tiwaha I clearly, you got to do something with this life. Like, this life was given to you. When I was doing deeper study of what people would consider, like, the karmic path, as it pertains to activism, that's not enough. Works, 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 works. works. But if you don't have love of all people, so that's where the bhakti comes in. Like, like, that's like the devotion. I was like, so I'm committed to seeing this moment in true for the people that I serve. Bhakti got me out, bhakti of, got bed. Me out of bed. Karma got me on the train. Karma got me on the train. Without love, I get Without so love, tired. work gets exhausting. Wanna make this world a I better place. I believe that my life is here to make others' lives bhakti better. Bhakti got me Bhakti got me out of Karma bed. Karma got me on the train. Karma got me on the train. Without love, I get so, I get so tired, tired, and I just wanna make the world a better place. The normal that we're pining for is gone. One of the blessings of deep practice, Buddhist and/or yogic, is that you have to practice non-attachment. We have to be radically present to create the future. If you're hearkening for something that's never coming back, that's suffering. Saturday, March 13th, Florence, Massachusetts. I arrived yesterday with my heart still going through withdrawals from the mountains of Colorado and the flow of life I had there. Here everything is familiar, but in a disorienting way. It's my future laid on top of my past with a decade-long gap in between. I have changed, and the software running the simulation has been updated. There are new buildings and people next to the old buildings and people. Albert Einstein once said that time is just something we invented to make motion seem simple. We use motion to keep track of time. It used to be the rotation of our planet around its own axis or the cycles of the moon, our seasons and the sun as we travel in an ellipse around it. Today we use lasers to measure the oscillations of cesium atoms in an atomic clock. Tomorrow's measurements will use entangled atoms. But we are all clocks of sorts, as is everything that exists in the material universe. The average span of a human life, the average life of a cell in our body, the average life cycle of a solar system or of a butterfly. We all arise, stay for a while, and then transform. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me. Here is where you can find Reggie. Born of the pandemic, active peace yoga has become a force. We teach uh, online mostly for obvious reasons, but we've been able to offer Hatha style uh, yoga and basic meditation to the DNC, the DCCC, so major political entities and regular folk rooted in a belief that when you internalize the practice, and make it a lifestyle that magic happens therein. Yoga for me is not an activity, it's a discipline. It's a discipline, it's a lifestyle. And it is a something that I keep coming back to day by day, moment by moment, that's given me the peace so profound that I can make it actionable. And that active peace has led to like impeaching a president, has led to flipping the House of Representatives, not by myself, but being of service to the moment and empowering other people where, whereby we could do these amazing things. So activepeaceyoga.com is the website. 
um, and you know, Active Peace Yoga on Instagram, O Reggie Global on Instagram is my main handle. Say, Say it, it again. again. ActivePeaceYoga.com. Breathe, Breathe in. again just checking in from the future this episode was released march 14th 2021 the voice you are hearing now is future me the intro to the outro of this episode contained some errors that had to be addressed and so i'm just hacking in from a rainy day in may of 2021 i can't tell you much about the future without creating havoc in the timeline just know that there's lots of ufo sightings i have a friend named v haddad who is a badass singer songwriter and a fan of the show, and I asked them to contribute a song to this episode as my way of setting an intention for future collaborations with interesting people. The making of this weird little Warrior One project has been magical as it evolves and finds its fans. And this song is called The Future is Wide Open. V can be found on SoundCloud at V Music and on YouTube at V Music Station. That's V-I-E Music, V-I-E. Visit our show notes at warrioronepodcast.com to find links to this and all other stuff we talked about.